Hello, everyone, as you're filing in this evening, or maybe morning for you, maybe afternoon, lots of time zones, welcome. Uh, this is the Brooklyn Rail's 610th New Social Environment. I'm Carolyn, the Programs Associate here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Pamela Corey, Fan Tao Nguyen, Gwen Chin Ti, and Paul Gladstone. We're thrilled to welcome poet Hai Deng Fan here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a living document of resources and action. The Brooklyn Rail would like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring our NSE program and making these daily conversations possible and for their support of our growing archive. You can view today's event and our full archive on the Rail's YouTube channel. And now to introduce today's guests and hosts, Pamela Wynn Corey researches and teaches modern and contemporary art history, focusing on Southeast Asia within a broader transnational Asian and global context. Her first book, The City in Time, Contemporary Art and Urban Form in Vietnam and Cambodia from the University of Washington Press was the recipient of a Millard Mays Publication Fund from the College Art Associ Association. Based in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam and trained as a painter, Fan Tao Nguyen is a multimedia artist whose practice encompasses video, painting, and installation. Drawing from literature, philosophy, and daily life, Fan observes ambiguous issues and social conventions in history. Fan has had many solo and group exhibitions, including Tate St. Ives and Na San Collective. In addition to her work as a multimedia artist, she is co-founder of the Collective Art Labor, which explores cross-disciplinary practices and develops art projects that benefit the local community. Based in Hanoi, Nguyen Chun Ti is a filmmaker and artist, traversing boundaries between film, documentary, video art, installation, and performance. Her practice currently explores the potential of sound and listening and the multiple relations between the image sound and space with ongoing interests in history, memory, ecology, representation, and the unknown. In 2009, Wynn founded Hanoi Doc Lab, an independent center for documentary film and moving image. And award-winning critical theorist and cultural historian, Paul Gladstone is the inaugural Judith Nielsen Chair Professor of Contemporary Art at the University of New South Wales and a distinguished affiliate of the UK-China Humanities Alliance, Tsinghua University. He's an, an inaugural co-editor of the book series Contemporary East Asian Visual Said Cultures, Societies, and Politics, and was founding principal editor of the Journal of Contemporary Chinese Art. Thank you all so much for being here today. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Paul. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Before I go any further, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge that I'm speaking from Gadigal land here in Sydney, authority over which was never ceded. Absolutely delighted to be moderating this panel uh, this morning, my time this evening and elsewhere, uh, maybe late morning in uh, Vietnam. Um, it's a real pleasure to have Pamela T and Tao here today. I think what we're going to hear about in, in this panel about contemporary art in Vietnam are multiple connections the connections of contemporary art in Vietnam to the international art world, uh, to wider art worlds and cultures within Southeast Asia and East Asia, which connects back to some of the earlier panels that we have contributed to the new social environment series. And of course, uh, relationships with localized cultures in Vietnam. And uh, I'm very pleased to hand over now to Pamela, who's going to give us a a kind of bit of context, a bit of historical context about uh, modern and contemporary art in Vietnam. Over to you, Pamela. Great, thank you so much, Paul. Um, thank you so much to, to Professor Gladstone and the organizers at Brooklyn Rail for um, inviting us to do this panel. And thank you to my co-panelists, Thi and Tao, for also taking the time to share their work with, a, with the audience here. Um, Carolyn, could you uh, start my slides? <clears throat> oh. 
Sorry, bear with me one second. Get in among the money. One more second here. All right, can everyone see the slides here? Yeah, 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 looks good. Um, <clears throat> so I'm very conscious of time and it's a, it's a real tall task to try to provide a, a kind of sketch of art history in a short amount of time, but I thought it would be good to provide some context for um, contemporary art practice in Vietnam today, um, because some of these historical developments had a bearing on institutional formation and, um, you know, the ways in which there were alternative sites for formation as well um, for contemporary Vietnamese art. Um, so this is a, a, a sketch. Um, I'm going to move through it fairly quickly. So there's not a lot of time for, for depth or detail, but I'm really happy to um, elaborate on any of this uh, in the Q&A. So I thought, um, <clears throat> a kind of formative development um, that you know stretches back to almost a hundred years ago is the um, establishment of the fine arts school in Hanoi under French colonialism, the Ecole de Beaux Arts de l'Indochine, which was established in 1925 in Hanoi by a French painter, Victor Tardieu, and colonial administrator. Um, in consultation and collaboration with a Vietnamese artist named Nam Sun. And the reason why this is significant, even though um, perhaps you're wondering, you know, what bearing does this have on contemporary art? Surely, you know, this is a kind of artifact of the colonial past, is that it did uh, create the grounds for the development of a kind of uh, artistic modernism in the colonial context and also um, provided certain tools and discourses that enabled artists to develop a kind of vision for a national art later on, especially after um, independence from France. And um, I think something that it's important to bear in mind is that some of the courses that were developed um, really um, ingrained artists with ideas about medium. Okay, so oil painting, uh, silk painting, and lacquer painting, for example, um, that these were no longer, well, oil painting was an introduction, um, something that was introduced by the French, but lacquer painting and silk painting did have precedence um, in Vietnam, although not within the discursive framework of fine art. So fine art was a new kind of discursive framework, and the idea that one would train in one of these mediums um, in order to become a modern artist was something that developed in this institution. And this has a bearing on the development of artistic education in Vietnam more broadly um, through the 80s and 90s. And I think even today, to some extent, you know, these courses of medium-based training are still in place. Um, so many artists go in and basically specialize in one of these things, oil painting or silk painting or lacquer painting. And the degree to the the degree to which you are assessed as having certain technical skills and talent determines which of these mediums you can continue to pursue. You know, some are considered more challenging than others. So moving on. Oh, sorry. Oh, thank you, Carolyn. I forgot that you were controlling and I was hitting my arrow key. <laughs> um, as I mentioned before, you know. This laid the grounds for the development of a, a kind of vision for a national modern art. And so it's not as though these um, residues of colonialism or colonial art education with, were discarded with colonialism um, after uh, 1945 and then 1954. In 1954 is when the Geneva Accords were drawn. The country was partitioned into the uh, Republic of Vietnam in the South and the Democratic Republic of Vietnam in the North. The North being a kind of communist state, the South being nominally democ democratic, um, arguably. 
But the artists, you know, many of the artists who had trained in the colonial art school continued to work in similar techniques and styles, but shifted content in order to adhere to um, new prescriptions on the relationship between Marxism and art and culture. Um, this was in the North in particular, because the North was a, uh, following a communist orientation. Um, later, when the country was reunited or reunified in 1975, um, Carolyn, can you advance the slide? Um, in 1975, after the country or North and South were unified um, and Vietnam became the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, then socialist re realism was the artistic sort of prescription for all public artistic practices up until 1986. But I think it's important to note that socialist realism in Vietnam is not necessarily a kind of unified um, discourse, nor is it a um, kind of homogenous aesthetic at all. There's a lot of room for individualism and for experimentation within Vietnamese socialist realism. Um, and in that way, it's a little bit difficult to define socialist realism um, compared to China, uh, perhaps even North Korea. But I, I guess you could argue that socialist realism, even in the context of China, is still not necessarily a homogenous and unified um, aesthetic or uh, ideological artistic practice. Uh, could you advance? Thank you. And instead of just labeling post-1945 practice in the North or post-1975 practice in the South as socialist realism, um, we can also think of it as revolutionary art, um, even documentary art, because um, a lot of artists were soldiers and they were in the battlefield, they were at the front. And a lot of the art that we see coming out of this period took the form of sketches and drawings and things that were meant to sort of capture um, visions of life on the front. And so this is a very significant part of the body of artistic production that comes out of this period. Uh, Carolyn, could you advance, please? So, um, <clears throat> The United States began withdrawing troops um, after 1968 and had withdrawn all of its military troops by 1973, leaving the South to basically fend for itself. And in 1975, communist troops uh, sort of took Saigon, the capital of the South, uh, shortly afterwards renamed it Ho Chi Minh City. From 1975 to 1986, Vietnam underwent a period uh, that's called the subsidy period. So basically a unified socialist Republic of Vietnam um, attempting to realize a kind of a centralized economy a communist political system. Um, they struggled economically and the party decided that it was time to make some uh, adaptations in the way that um, the former Soviet Union or Russia had done and then China with liberalizing economic reforms. So they officially launched Doi Mai or these liberalizing economic reforms in 1986 and um, became uh, a market economy with socialist orientation. And so um, a lot of businesses became privatized. They opened up borders to tourism. Um, and it was really, it was off to a slow start. And it really wasn't until the 1990s and the normalization of diplomatic relations between the US and the Socialist Republic of Vietnam that we can see Vietnam really sort of um, getting caught up in the tide of globalization. We have the introduction of the internet in the late 90s. And here I'm just showing some of the images that give you a sense of the ambiguity of feelings about these changes and you know Vietnam's entrance into globalization through these poster campaigns that <clears throat> on the one hand try to inculcate a sense of socialist citizenry in the people but at you know also try to promote the benefits of economic liberalization but also the dangers um, 
And then I thought it was interesting to also show this Coca-Cola poster from 1996, uh, where you have this young woman drinking a Coke alongside eating uh, what most consider to be a quintessential Vietnamese dish, which is a bowl of pho. And these are images that are um, from a recently published book of uh, the archive of Veronica Radulovic. Uh, Carolyn, could you advance? So um, with globalization, with Vietnam entering into the world economy, um, I thought I would show some images for the sake of comparison in terms of how the world became introduced to art from Vietnam. So on the one hand, in 1989, we have a sort of groundbreaking exhibition the, that marks one of the exhibition that marks the so-called global turn in 1989, which is Magicien de la Terre in Paris, which really has a kind of emphasis on contemporary, contemporaneity and globalism in contemporary art. <clears throat> on the other hand, the first exhibition of art from Vietnam to travel outside the country <clears throat> since the end of the war is Uncorked Soul, which was organized by an art gallery in Hong Kong in 1991. And the focus was really, um, I guess, some contemporary art, but a lot of a focus on a kind of traditional modernist aesthetic, sort of modern art. Um, and at the same time, in 1991, this is also an opportunity for American institutions to begin looking back at the war and um, an exhibition like this, as seen by both sides, attempted to show dual perspectives, you know, sort of the, the visions and artworks of Americans and um, Vietnamese artists. So there was a real focus on the wartime experience here. And an exhibition like this would play a part in a kind of cultural project of re reconciliation between the US and Vietnam. Uh, Carolyn, could you advance, please? So, however, in Vietnam, in the 1990s, um, there's quite a bit going on in terms of artists um, embracing uh, the openings presented by Doi Moi to some extent and attempting to find alternative spaces for artistic practice and exhibition and discourse outside of the so-called official spaces that fell under the auspices of government organizations, primarily the Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism, which um, provided the sort of umbrella for um, the Fine Arts Association, the Fine Arts Museum, the Fine Arts Schools. So, um, this is a, an important space founded by the artist Vu Zantan and his wife, um, Natalia Krevskaya. And their space was called Salon Natasha. And it was basically Vu Zantan's studio, but this was a very important space um, as a gathering ground for alternative conversations and questions about artistic practice. Um, it was a place that a lot of international visitors would often visit. Um, it was a significant space for the development of a burgeoning uh, generation of contemporary artists in the 1990s. Uh, Carolyn, could you advance to the next slide? Um, <clears throat> we also have uh, the introduction of um, a foreign teacher, a German artist named Veronica Radulovic, who was actually um, allowed to teach at the University of Fine Arts in Hanoi through um, the DAAD exchange program, which was an agreement with the German government to have a kind of faculty exchange or to send faculty to come teach. And she served as a kind of mentor and a friend and facilitator for another group of artists in the 1990s who are also considered to be kind of forerunners and pioneers in contemporary art. And this was in Hanoi. And uh, many of those artists dabbled in performance art, site-specific art, um, you know, new engagements with installation and space. Um, abstraction was actually, I mean, it, it may not seem like a super contemporary <laughs> form of practice, but this was something that had been, that was not allowed um, in the North for over 30 years and had not been allowed um, to be publicly exhibited in the South for um, 11 years. So with Doi Mai and new um, sort of openings in artistic and creative expression, artists 
returned to abstraction or developed it in new ways, both in the North and the South. So in the North, we have the Gang of Five. In the South, we have a group lo loosely known as the Group of Ten. Um, but the 1992 exhibition, Abstract Painting, was the first exhibition of abstract painting to take place since the end of the war. Uh, could you advance the slide, Carolyn? As I mentioned before, there were new experiments with um, site and space and form and medium taking place in the 1990s. Um, here's a, an important work by the Japanese Vietnamese American artist, Jun Win Hatsushiba. This is an early work of his, one of his first to be exhibited in Vietnam. And um, it took place in the Museum of Fine Arts in Ho Chi Minh City. So this was a colonial structure and he made use of the architecture to produce this very ambitious, large scale installation. Um, <clears throat> uh, could you advance the slide, Carolyn? And other artists also were engaging with space in new ways and with performance as well. Um, on the, sorry, there's a mistake with the caption. On the left is a collaborative performance between Vietnamese artists Li Huang Li and Anita Yu Ali um, that took place at the Blue Space Contemporary Art Center, which is the same one we just looked at, that this was a new space for contemporary art that was housed at the Museum of Fine Arts. And it was an important site for um, interaction and new collaborations and basically new experimental forms. And on the right, we have a very important space, Nia San in um, Hanoi, um, which was a, a pioneering space as well for sort of experimental alternative practices. And here we have a work by the late artist, uh, Le Hui Huang. Uh, Carolyn, could you advance the slide? Okay. Um, so I wanted to mention that Jun Win Hatsushiba is one of the one artists who's considered a was considered a diasporic artist who returned to Vietnam and was based there, or as my colleague Viet Le um, calls them, he calls them di diasporic returnee artists. There were a number of artists um, <clears throat> who had left Vietnam as refugees or perhaps um, were of Vietnamese heritage but had never lived in Vietnam, who decided to return to Vietnam or go to Vietnam in the early 2000s or even late 1990s and sort of reconnect with their heritage or explore opportunities for artistic practice there. Um, one of these is Din Kiu Le, um, very significant artist. And he has also been responsible for um, co-founding San Art, which is a very important long running alternative space. Um, Trinti Minh Ha is not an artist who returned to Vietnam and made it her home base, but she's a diasporic artist from Vietnam who also kind of drew Vietnam into international focus with her filmic practice and her international profile. Uh, Carolyn, could you advance? Um, so here are some examples. There was One could say there was a kind of burgeoning of alternative spaces in the 2000s, both in Hanoi and in Ho Chi Minh City um, with San Art, Atelier Wonderful, um, Rilega Gallery, uh, T founded Doc Lab. So uh, there's more, but um, this is just to give you a sense of how things were shaping up in the 2000s um, in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City. And Carolyn, could you advance? I thought I would put this in here because um, I know that there's been uh, uh, a few episodes of this series that maybe have focused on China and also thinking of my colleague, uh, Professor Gladstone. And this is a question I'm also talking about with some colleagues in Vietnamese art is, you know, what does post-socialism in Vietnamese contemporary art look like? Or is there a kind of post-socialist art in the way that perhaps we describe cynical realism or political pop in China? And I think the answer is that there isn't really a, a movement or a collective sensibility, or there hasn't been a collective sensibility or an aesthetic sort of inclination like that in the context of Vietnam. I pulled a couple artists here who I thought perhaps we could think of in a kind of post-socialist realist vein, but there's certainly, I, I wouldn't say that there's, there's ever been a kind of unified mm, collective impulse to work in that vein. And perhaps that's due to the nature of socialist realism in Vietnamese art history as not having 
such a unified aesthetic sensibility compared to other places. Uh, Carolyn, could you advance? Okay, this is my last slide. I hope I kept to my time. Um, so I, I do get questions sometimes about, you know, how would you characterize Vietnamese contemporary art or what is the kind of quintessential trait of Vietnamese contemporary art? And I always kind of say that there's no such thing. There's no such, there's no kind of, I, I would not, I would not want to generalize um, the diversity of practices that we see in Vietnam today. They're as wide ranging and diverse as we would see in any, any international context. Um, artists are concerned with a, a large wide range of concerns, aesthetic, technological, political, historical. Um, so I'm just showing a few examples here. You know, artists are working in a wide range of practices individually, collectively, or in socially engaged ways. Um, so on that note, I think I'll wrap up. I hope that was, I hope I kept that in brief. And I know that um, we're now going to pass things to uh, Tang Nguyen. Excellent, thank you, Pamela. That was, uh, I think, very enlightening and very concise, very clear. Um, perhaps we can circle around some questions related to the, the presentation later on. But I did like the, the, the little nod towards uh, some of our earlier uh, presentations in the series. I think that raised some very interesting questions. As you say, I think we're now going on, move on to Tao, who's going to uh, tell us a little bit about her practice with reference to some specific works. So Tao, over to you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I will click uh, share screen for now. Hello, can you see my screen? We can, Tao. Okay. And in my presentation, I will use the first few slides to just share my influences and what shaped my practice nowadays as an artist. So, um, I was trained as a lacquer painter in the Fine Arts University in Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, but when I was a student, my first encounter with contemporary art uh, was with uh, Nya San Studio, uh, as Pamela already mentioned in her uh, presentation. A very, uh, for me, is a very uh, important uh, alternative artist run space um, in Hanoi. And actually, my first encounter with contemporary art uh, was with performance art. So, as a student, I was uh, invited to come to Nya San and did some performance there. And for me, Nya San uh, is always um, a very uh, important and is a space where our artists can come and discuss and uh, is uh, in a very loose and a very non-structured and uh, alternative way. And uh, I also want to show a slide from um, another space that is uh, very formative for my practice, which is uh, Atelier Wonderful, uh, based in Saigon, but it was co-founded by uh, Vietnamese uh, French artist Sandrine Luque and her partner Betran. And uh, as, a uh, as a first year student, uh, I came here to her apartment and uh, they were showing a, a video piece and it was actually my first time encounter uh, a video work uh, by Bruce Norman. And uh, there was a group of students uh, in my uh, class come to this event, but uh, uh, most of us found it quite hard to understand and uh, um, from our background we found it not related to art at all but personally I feel it so relevant and I I got very uh, intrigued and I uh, I feel it uh, kind of a formative mo moment for me uh, of thinking about how to shape my practice then the third slide that I would like to show is just like my student work because I can correspond very well to how Pamela 
uh, introduce the art education in, in Vietnam, even though the art school in Hanoi uh, uh, already established a very kind of colonial way of uh, art education and the art school in Saigon is kind of took over this curriculum. But one of the very important um, practice that I found is um, the, the idea of field, uh, field trips. So uh, even during the uh, colonial period, the early painters like uh, Tô Ngoc Vân is already encouraged by uh, his French uh, professors to go out to uh, the rice fields or the countryside to sketch uh, people. And uh, even now in uh, my art education, uh, it's very important like uh, field trip is compulsory. So uh, as the, uh, if you can see like the images, uh, the photographs, you can see that uh, uh, I am here in the blue t-shirt and we actually came to the countryside and as, uh, as art students, we go to the remote countryside to uh, offer classes, classes. So in this picture, I was teaching English to a group of uh, elementary school students uh, in the countryside. And uh, while doing those practices, we also do sketches. And uh, for me, it's like a kind of um, uh, inheritance from a kind of socialist ideas because uh, Ho Chi Minh used to say that uh, the, the artist could be the shelter, like uh, a, a writer could use his paint to fight a painter could use his or her brushes, a photographer could use his camera. So the tools are like for the artist to, to, to kind of uh, um, give a representation to a social meanings. Um, and then uh, my kind of um, um, also very important uh, formative moment is uh, in 2016 when I um, I was under the mentorship of the American um, performance and video artist, John Jonas, uh, based in New York. And uh, of course, a very important one of the um, a pioneer um, artists uh, working with um, videos and performance. And uh, uh, during these two years, I kind of just follow her and uh, work with her in many of her uh, my projects. And after these two years, I feel like uh, I wanted to move my practice from a painterly based um, dimension to a multimedia based dimension, which include also um, installation and uh, videos. So um, this is one of uh, my uh, earlier works that I uh, um, that I made uh, after I um, come back from my uh, education uh, because I did an MFA program in the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and when I come back to Ho Chi Minh City I I was kind of like a very um, uh, feel like uh, I wanted to do something that relate to um, my own history, but not specifically about any uh, narrative. And I was in a residency at, uh, uh, it's called Sun Art La Laboratory, um, uh, a residency program that was uh, initiated by uh, Sun Arts. And in this six months residency, I was uh, kind of having a talking partner. Uh, my talking partner was Jun Wen Hashishiba, who, who Pamela showed one of his very important work in her slide. And uh, in this series, I call it a uh, looking down series. And I, um, uh, I also kind of still maintain my practice as a painter and those are uh, oil painting on the backing of X-ray films. Um, and uh, it's just like a repetition of one single action of uh, human beings uh, bowing their heads or looking down 
and I can't investigate these gestures because I started to being very interested in uh, specific history uh, that relates to the Vietnamese context, but it's not um, officially recognized or or um, or this history is manipulated in somehow. And in this presentation, I mainly talk about this particular event, which is um, the famine of 1945 in the north of Vietnam during the Japanese occupation. Um, so uh, while doing these uh, paintings, even though they look uh, quite ambiguous, but I actually based on some um, uh, carve, archival photographs. And when I was researching this uh, event of the famine in the north of Vietnam in 1945, I I feel a very lack of concrete um, documentary about this event. So there is oral recordings or there's some photographs, but there are very lack of uh, academic research. So I have just uh, expanding my um, uh, preferences to other uh, countries that has been through this period, such as um, uh, Malaya and. Uh, I uh, visited Singapore and I came to this, uh, they call it the Museum of Old Ford Factory where the uh, British um, signed uh, the agreement to surrender to the Japanese. And in this museum, they show some images of the local uh, people uh, kind of bowing um, as a way of showing respect to the um, invaders. And I was very inspired by this gesture. So I kind of make those paintings and it doesn't show anything about the historical backgrounds, but you can see um, already um, how I preferences um, certain events in history in a visual um, representation. Uh, it was shown at Sun Art um, during uh, as a result of my residency. And um, uh, in 2019, I have um, come by all of my uh, research relating to this event to a three channel uh, a video installation. Um, it's called Mute Grain, which I would show a short clip for now. So oh, you may need to unshare and then reshare again um, this time the video as we can't see it yet. Oh, I, I will share then. Oh, it's in another screen. Can you see it now? Perfect. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. 
I will go back to my um, presentation. Uh, just one moment, please. Um, so uh, uh, this video was uh, um, okay. Uh, can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, this video has a, 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 a combination of um, fictions and um, uh, archival, uh, um, archival recordings. Um, the, the content of the video is um, about uh, two siblings named uh, March and August. And um, I, I named them uh, March and August based on the uh, a Vietnamese saying called uh, Thang Ba Mu Tam, uh, which literally means March and August. And uh, those months are uh, according to the lunar calendar and to the agricultural cycle is like the poorest month of the uh, year when um, the harvest is not yet ready. So the rice is cut, ran out, and the farmers usually suffer or have to borrow rice to, to survive. And um, the, the narrative is a combination of uh, oral recordings of the um, of the famine witnesses. And the oral recordings was a kind of, um, uh, I, I collected the oral recordings of the famine witnesses through an archive of a professor um, at the uh, bottom image on the left. Uh, his name is uh, Professor Văn Tao. And uh, in the early 90s, um, he and one uh, Japanese uh, researcher named Furata Moto, uh, uh, together with the His History Institute, come to the Red River Delta in Vietnam and uh, uh, take oral recordings of the uh, old people who have been through this famine period. And in the 90s, those people are already in there. Uh, 70s. So I can uh, select some um, uh, narrative that I heard from the oral recordings of those people to uh, create this narrative. And um, I also want to explain a little bit about the archival photographs that I used at the beginning of the video. Uh, the uh, very famous um, pictures of Vietnam famine by uh, uh, photographs for Ang Nin. And um, uh, even though I can't mention that um, uh, these events are like not discussed well, like publicly, but those photographs are very well known. They are not like, uh, they are not hidden or not a taboo. You can easily find those photographs on, um, on online platforms. And I, I feel there is a contradiction because the cap material or the cap images that that could be seen and the cap discourse that are um, not uh, well articulated or not well mentioned. So I use these very graphic um, images and and cap painted over them with my 
um, rather romanticized images of welfare children in order to create a contrast of how I feel about how those events are uh, represented. And um, in the in the video uh, in the video uh, installation, I I also uh, include uh, preferences from um, literature, and uh, this preference from literature um, is becomes a kind of uh, continuous uh, trademark in all of my works. And uh, in the beginning, um, uh, that uh, of the video that I show you is is. It's actually an excerpt from the uh, the novel uh, Anand Damas, um, um, and uh, for me, um, I found those parallel movement. Even though this novel talked about uh, the famine in India in the 17th century, but the the language and the uh, the events are so um, similar, and I. I feel there is a kind of universalism in all of those, those events that even though happen in the past or maybe in the future or in a very different and remote culture. And um, in the video, um, I also pair the, the writings of uh, Kawabata Yasunari, um, the Japanese writer who um, kind of wrote uh, very short prose uh, and I select the, the, the stories that he wrote um, in the 40s and in the 30s. And um, there's a kind of a way to bring the poetry and the lightness to um, these very um, uh, graphic and very uh, traumatized memory. Um, and I also uh, work as a painter. So when I make a project uh, during mid grain, aside from uh, the videos, I also explore other mediums such as, um, uh, these are the two characters, uh, the two main characters in my film and I kind of translate them into, uh, into the world of painting. And uh, these are um, uh, two paintings from, um, a series called Dream of March and August. And uh, they are painted on uh, watercolor on silk, um, very uh, traditional way, like how I was taught in the art school. And um, this series, are, um, uh, they come in a deep teach, one depicting August, which is the woman, and uh, one depicting March uh, is the brother who lost her sister, who lost his sister during this story. And the way I display them is um, I hung I hung them from the ceiling, so they are not like a conventional uh, on the wall like a conventional painting. But I really like this uh, this quality of of silk of being translucent. So they become almost like a, a sculptural object and you can walk around and then you can see the front and the back of the, of the installation. And uh, with this installation, I also very inspired by a Chinese classic novels. It's called uh, Dream of the Red Chamber. And um, uh, this, uh, so when you enter the project, the first thing you enter is this kind of an illusion. So you see like those uh, paintings with uh, pastel colors and they don't depict any um, traumatized images. The images are kind of uh, romantic, I have to say. And it's a kind of illusion, it's like you enter like a, a dream of 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 uh, of things, and then you kind of move around this illusion in order to kind of realize a a fact. And the, so you have to kind of pass over those paintings before you see the videos. 
Um, and, um, and when you pass through the paintings, do you have to, uh, I also uh, created an um, installation, it's called uh, No Tooth Cloth for the Bones. Um, because uh, um, what, I, I, what I read um, about uh, this particular event is people keep using the word um, uh, nhổ lúa, trồng đay. It means uh, uproot rice and grow jute. So somehow I feel like the whole event of the famine is summarized into this uh, very short set uh, grows of uproot the rice and grow the jute. Uh, uh, it means that the uh, the Japanese uh, occupiers and also the French uh, forced Vietnamese farmers to uproot their wrong young rice to grow um, another materials that might be more um, uh, beneficial to the war, uh, uh, which is uh, cute for, uh, for fibers. But uh, in this installation, I basically create a curtain uh, using the jute stock and, and there's no explanation. So you can just pass through this very abstract form and you interact with it and it uh, uh, creates a, a cell, um, a very simple and abstract cell before you enter the video installation. Um, I just gonna play a, a short clip of, of how the cell of the piece uh, works. And so now I'm going to share screen. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, during the presentation, I just gonna mainly talk about this particular project and I would like to end my presentation here uh, and pass over to T. Many, many thanks Tao, that was fascinating insights into your work and uh, perhaps we can come back to some questions um, about that. But uh, moving on, uh, T. Uh, would you like to make your presentation? Uh, we don't have sound. But Colonel, these people, the Viet Cong, they fought the French and the Japanese for 30 years. Do you really think they can be weeded out? I think that anything that lives in a cave can be weeded out. And I just take hope they send you to take Europe or take Korea. Or... Going to Vietnam. So bye bye, Jenny. They sending me to Vietnam. This is whole other country. Most of you will go to Vietnam. Some of you will not come back. Wie war's in Vietnam? Laut. Ah, ja. 
What would you regard as the most outstanding and significant event of the last decade? The war in Vietnam, sir. More significant than the landing on the moon? For ten years, no man knew where this Vietnam lay. Vietnam is just in war visible. We are waiting for the seven o'clock news. Du hoffst, dass es darin etwas gibt, was dich moralisch empört, damit du den Mut hast, abzudrücken. Can you hear me? Great. Um, yeah, so I just run the two trailers from two of my projects, films. Um, so you uh, have some flavor of the kind of uh, materials and approach that I use. Um, yeah, and maybe you can start the slides now. Yes, yeah, so I, I hope to make some connections to what Pamela and Tang Nguyen just uh, presented. Uh, I think there are some similarities or connections, but there are also differences. Um, first of all, because my, I feel like uh, when listening to Pamela, I feel like I, I kind of knew this history because I was born and grew up in Vietnam. And, um, you know, I lived with my grandfather who was a poet. And so I had uh, kind of great uh, influences from him and from uh, my environment, but I didn't, I, I didn't go to the art school or the film school. Um, so in, in, in some way, I also didn't really share that kind of, um, lineage of uh, Vietnamese uh, art history. Um, and um, I always feel a little bit like uh, an outsider to, to everything, um, even though I was um, uh, practicing um, filmmaking and art making in, um, you know, for uh, maybe 15 years or something, but um, uh, never really feel like uh, completely inside you know either the film industry or the or the art 
industry. Um, and but is there something that I like about this kind of position of uh, being in between places and um, kind of um, have the um, access to different kind of audiences as well, which I really like because um, I, I work with um, different kind of communities. Uh, maybe you can move to the next uh, slide. Um, yeah, so I throw in here some terms that can kind of describe my practice um, in terms of the kind of issues and the kind of materials and approaches um, that I like to explore. Um, yeah, I, I try to group my projects into uh, three different areas that, uh, that will make it kind of more um, uh, easier to introduce to you. Um, I actually, I didn't really um, had the plan from the beginning that this would be the kind of materials or work that I would make, but now kind of looking back and try to group them into groups, I could see that uh, in terms of uh, mediums and materials, um, I can see a few groups. Uh, so the first one is the archival and file footage material, which I have been using quite a lot. Um, so for example, this, this series uh, called landscape series number one, um, where I, um, I found, I look at um, many, many uh, press photographs online uh, from uh, different kind of local newspapers. And um, I was very interested in um, the idea of landscape and how landscape could be function as a quiet witness to history. Um, I, I had this thought uh, from traveling across the country and uh, working on um, documentary projects, um, kind of uh, trying to connect with the past and uh, the history in Vietnam. Um, but I was, um, I, I was very interested in the, the possibility of, um, of just landscape and empty landscapes as a container to own these kind of uh, significant events. Um, and um, so I was working with uh, found footage material and trying to find what is already there that would help me to express this idea. And this also tied to the fact that the local people, the people who live on the, on the ground, um, they, they have kind of, they have no voice in the history. Um, I talked to them, you know, to get their stories and uh, try to make something out of it. Um, but, uh, but largely, you know, in the history books or in the media, um, their voices and their stories are pretty much uh, silent. So I find a kind of a parallel between, um, you know, the kind of silent um, witness of, of the people and the silence of the landscape. Um, so I turn the footage, uh, I, I turn the, the press photos into a series of um, 35 millimeters um, slide projection um, and um, made it into kind of a fictional journey uh, through the landscape. Um, this, the other, this one, Song to the Front, was based on a, a classic movie uh, made in the north of Vietnam in 1973, just before the war ended. And uh, largely the cinema of uh, Vietnam at that point, from the north at least, um, was the uh, socialist cinema and it was uh, mainly propaganda, uh, you know, to kind of praise the uh, patriotic um, efforts of people in the north. And also uh, after the war, that would be about the building of socialism in the north. Um, and uh, actually my mother worked for the uh, documentary film studio. And so uh, I kind of grew up with a part of this history and also watching um, this kind of movies. Um, so in this film, um, I made it into like a, a experimental film um, using um, the soundtrack, the, the music from uh, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. 
um, because for me that music, um, um, the 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 ballet, the music was um, was about the the rights in um, Middle Age Russia uh, when they um, sacrificed the um, uh, virgin, uh, the 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 girls, and uh, it, it's kind of like you know some parallel. Um, to the movie uh, and the kind of sacrifice of um, soldiers. Um, yeah, so you can move to next one. Um, the Vietnam, the movie you just watched the um, you just watched the trailer. Um, the film itself was uh, it's about fifty minutes, and it's uh, it it um, it was a. Um, a found footage film made from uh, many, many films uh, that I survey um, that had something to do or mention uh, Vietnam in the film. Um, and I, I found um, on these films from um, the States or Europe, but also uh, Asian films as well. Um, and the, uh, in this film, um, my premise is um, all the um, characters in the film would have to mention the word Vietnam for that clip to be used. Um, so throughout the film, you would see many, many uh, characters and people mention the word uh, Vietnam in different contexts and how they, how they said it. Um, it. It took me a very long time to make this one because you know, like the Vietnam related material from outside of Vietnam was uh, a lot. And at the beginning, I, um, I collected so much material, not only um, narrative films, but also a lot of like documentaries, uh, television, um, also um, uh, pro propaganda and educational films, army films, um, anything that I could find. Um, and But at the end, I trim it down to um, include mostly uh, just uh, narrative films. Um, and um, another one is called Eleven Men. Uh, this one, I also use a lot of uh, Vietnamese classic movies from the North. Um, but uh, all of these films had uh, the same actress. Uh, she was the one um, who was also in Song to the Front. Um, so um, basically I kind of survey her career. She's, she was very famous. Her name is Nhu Quỳnh. Um, so I kind of survey her career from the time when she was uh, like 18 to these days when she's already in her um, 60s or se even 70. Um, so it is kind of like a story of a woman, um, you know, through, throughout her, um, her life. Um, but I use, um, I kind of reverse the gaze. Um, so actually in, in this film, you, you would see, um, you would see the portraits of the man in her life who was actually like her partner in the, in the movies. And, uh, but the voice over would be coming from her. So the voice is hers. And I use, um, I use uh, one of uh, uh, Kafka's uh, short story called Eleven Sons. Um, when he was, he was talking about his, um, he, um, he talked about each one of his 11 sons and kind of talking about all their shortcomings and weaknesses. And uh, so it's kind of a film that uh, at the end it show, uh, one is the you know, history of um, Vietnamese cinema, uh, socialist cinema, and how it changed to today into kind of a more commercialized cinema as well. Um, second, um, you would kind of show the Vietnamese history itself because like throughout these movies, um, it's, um, you would see uh, Vietnam uh, from the time of uh, during World War II uh, to Japanese occupation, um, French, and then um, American um, American time in the in the South, and and then the socialist time, and then now it's a kind of more market oriented uh, uh, period. 
and um, but the the major kind of uh, gesture for me in this film is to reverse the gaze, uh, you know, to uh, the usual gaze of cinema to look at the world, the woman, women, uh, to kind of now like giving her a voice, and she's the one who tells the story, and we are looking at the men. Can you move on? Uh, this one is called Every Day is the 70s. Uh, this one I made in Hong Kong um, and um, uh, three channels and four channels of sound. Um, so this one um, um, is based on a story of a, a Chinese man uh, who grew up, who, who was born and grew up in uh, Chinatown in Saigon during the war. And then he escaped to Hong Kong when he was 17, just before the war ended. Uh, and then he lived in Hong Kong and uh, he loved um, records and he became um, kind of uh, one of the biggest uh, collection of um, uh, musical records in Hong Kong. Um, but we kind of talk about uh, his experience growing up in uh, Chinatown, in Saigon, and then escaping to Hong Kong. And then from the late 80s and early 90s and throughout the 90s um, in Hong Kong, um, it, was a, um, it was a kind of a um, crisis of, um, of uh, Vietnamese uh, migration um, from, from the south of uh, of Vietnam, but also from the 90s, there, there have been also the movement from the North as well because of uh, economic difficulties. Um, so there would be millions of people living in the camps in Hong Kong. Um, and so I basically with the media, um, with these three channels, I in the first one, um, I use the AP archives uh, that uh, cover all these events. And then in the second one, in the middle, um, I survey the cinema of uh, Hong Kong. Um, and based uh, on this, uh, um, on, I use only the, uh, the, the material that uh, all the films that had uh, um, Tony Lang, uh, as the main actor, uh, so he he became like a, a protagonist of the uh, um, of the cinema representation um, because they were like Hong Kong movies that were made about the uh, Vietnam War or about the um, Vietnamese refugees uh, in in Hong Kong later. Uh, and then the last one was the, basically it's the music shop of this guy, uh, you know, living in Hong Kong. And, um, and there, there would be uh, four different separate channels of sounds. Um, so depending on where you sit in the room and what you listen to, you kind of have a slightly different perspective and uh, narration uh, of the same image. Um, and in one, in one channel, you uh, basically you just hear the sound of the music that he play in his shop. Uh, okay, so the second group, I would kind of group it into essay films and um, coincidentally on the films that I put in here also deal with the uh, issue of indigeneity um, and indigenous cultures in Vietnam. But um, largely, I think many, many of my films, they all have the character, uh, characteristics of, uh, of essay film anyway. So, uh, so this first one is called Letters from Pandoranga. Uh, I made this in 2015, but I pre before that, I already started to work with the uh, people from the, the Cham, Cham people. They are indigenous uh, people living in central Vietnam. And in the past, actually, um, the Cham uh, occupied a very large territory in Vietnam. Um, uh, and it was uh, the, their kingdom, they have a home kingdom called the Champa. 
and it's a very significant uh, civilization um, influenced by Hinduism. Uh, and their religion is, uh, uh, they have two main groups, um, Hindu based and um, the other is uh, Islam. But actually their uh, form of religion um, is very, very indigenous. So they actually, they change um, a lot of the uh, uh, original kind of um, religions. And uh, so the reason why I was interested in the group first uh, was because um, about more than 10 years ago, the Vietnamese government um, decided to build the first two nuclear power plants on their land in the middle of uh, all their temples and uh, very important kind of cultural uh, uh, spaces. And uh, that is the last bit of land that uh, the Cham kind of occupy. Um, so I was very intrigued by this. And uh, there was very, very uh, kind of silence uh, in the media. And we in Vietnam, we would never heard anything about um, what was actually happening on the ground or whether the Cham themselves, uh, they would uh, protest. Um, and um, kind of ironically, uh, at the same time, I was in Japan and um, they just, uh, the Fukushima um, disaster just happened and uh, there was a lot of protests over there. And even the people in Japan, they protested against the nuclear power plant building in other countries, including Vietnam. But in Vietnam ourselves, we don't hear anything. Um, yeah, so I, when I came back to Vietnam, I was very um, curious about this and I kind of started to look into it and, and travel to the land and uh, through uh, spending some time in the village and in, the, in that region, um, I learned so much uh, about the Cham themselves and uh, also about the relationship between, relationship and history between the Vietnamese and the Cham and, um, and it was kind of the first time that I realized so many things about uh, uh, the issue of uh, indigenous uh, uh, people. And uh, in, in Vietnam at that point, I, uh, we, we never heard the term uh, indigenous or indig indigeneity. There was almost like no such term in Vietnam, you know, because the official language, they always call these people uh, everyone uh, who is not king, who is not Vietnamese majority, as uh, eth uh, ethnic minorities, and that is the, the the official term, and that everyone use. And there's so there's never kind of a question of um, what is the indigenous right. Um, yeah. So from this film, I was um, I was trying to do something about this uh, issue and. Uh, um, but uh, but the, 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 the story became so much uh, broader to me and um, it, it actually, it also became a, a film, an essay film that was talking about um, kind of my own position as an artist or filmmaker working with communities and especially a community of, um, of uh, not of my own. So basically I'm an outsider. And so how can I work in this kind of uh, situation and not um, feeling or kind of uh, dealing with the problem of being an outsider trying to represent uh, the other people. So I was uh, talking about kind of the power structure and the history of destruction and um, but also raising uh, the issue of um, how we can how we can do this uh, as an artist or filmmaker, um, not um, kind of um, abusing our our power of uh, who can who can control the image. Can you move? Uh, so, and this one is uh, uh, the next one that I, I did uh, following uh, letters from Pandiranga. It, it still has something to do with uh, indigenous uh, stories. Um, so in uh, 2011, uh, 17, 2017, um, 
I had a chance to spend some time in New Zealand and um, I, I observed the very powerful movement of uh, uh, indigenous uh, artists and filmmakers there and um, came across the, the name and work of uh, Barry Buckley, uh, who in the 80s and 90s um, was very um, active in um, kind of proposing and <clears throat> um, who was a pioneer in uh, as a filmmaker uh, to kind of start this uh, pushing this uh, movement of indigenous filmmakers. And his point is that, um, you know, like the, the image uh, and the story of the indigenous people have to be told by um, their own uh, methodology of uh, indigenous people. Um, in comparison to the many, many films that were made by the West, uh, he called it like the, um, the camera from the shore. Uh, so if you see many films from the West uh, about the uh, indigenous people or indigenous land, it's always, you always see the image of a ship uh, going in um, into the, the island and uh, kind of uh, with the camera pointing from the, from the shore to the land. Um, yeah, so this one would be the, the newest one that I made that relates to uh, indigenous culture. Um, it's, um, I, in this one, I was, uh, I was very interested in learning about and using um, the, um, the way that uh, indigenous people uh, perceive. Um, and um, in this land, um, in Central Highlands, and um, in particular, the Jarai people, and, but also true to other, um, other groups, uh, indigenous group as well, uh, their way of perceiving the world um, um, have been very different than the kind of very westernized, uh, globalized way, uh, which I feel that is very kind of visually um, um, uh, dominant. Um, and um, there, are other, there are other modes of perception, um, which is very interesting. Uh, so in this, um, in this group, and it's also co kind of coincide with my kind of increasing interest in, in sound. Um, their, their culture is uh, it's based on the oral culture and uh, listening and sound, uh, it's very, very important. Um, so I, will, I was, um, um, originally I was uh, trying to, um, to work off a, a very old French movie uh, that was made in 1930s in Vietnam. Uh, that was like a first uh, feature length film that was uh, also the first one that was shot in color, um, but now only a 16 millimeters uh, black and white version uh, survived. And uh, at that point it was a silent film uh, with a European soundtrack. Um, so I was interested in in making something in the same region and uh, perhaps uh, uh, the same people, but, um, but with a, a, a soundtrack that came from the, the land itself. Um, so it became um, this film uh, where I had a, an opportunity to work with um, some local musicians and um, oral st storytellers. <clears throat> Next, uh, the last group I would put in here, uh, I feel like there's something to do with um, using performativity and sound and listening. Um, okay, next. Yeah, so for example, this one was uh, made in 2010 with the Nyasan artist. Um, so in, in this work, uh, I asked uh, all the artists in the community, uh, each one to, to eat a piece of food 
and uh, just from the beginning to the end. And, at, uh, and I, so I filmed them uh, and uh, at the end they would say their name and they said what they just did. Um, this actually a little bit uh, kind of borrowed uh, the, 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 the form a little bit from um, Andy Warhol's, uh, he has a short uh, video um, the title, the title was uh, something like I'm, I'm Andy Warhol, I just ate a hamburger. Uh, but this one came from a very different context of uh, mostly of censorship in Vietnam and the kind of position of, uh, of artists in the Vietnamese society. Um, and it also tied to my work, my documentary work that I try to archive the the artist um, movements from the 50s and 60s. And, uh, and a lot of them um, were banned from publishing and uh, for many decades. Um, yeah, so, and then, yeah, so this one, uh, I already talked about every day the 70s, but in terms of uh, sound and listening, um, this work, uh, in this work, I explore, um, you know, the how different uh, media and, uh, you know, like from uh, media representation to cinema representation, um, how they cover, how they talk about the same history um, and then collapse it uh, with a personal memory. Um, and um, trying to use also sound and listening um, as you had to, um, as an audience, you, you, would, um, you would have a different position in, in the room and, uh, and uh, depending on the speaker that you sit next to, you, you would kind of get a, a somewhat different uh, narrative. Next, and how to improve the world is also uh, a lot about listening. Uh, it's about this uh, culture, indigenous culture that is based on sound and listening. But um, in the film, I also uh, try to um, kind of reduce somewhat um, the role of the image and uh, elevate the role of listening. Uh, for the uh, for this work, I have uh, two different versions. One is the film, a single channel film, and the other is the um, uh, it's an installation where I could um, I could arrange for different channels, different images uh, to be uh, sur to be surrounding the audience who would sit in the middle, and uh, and and the sound would also be. Of coming from around the audience. Um, so the role of sounds there would be uh, kind of uh, become much more important and also somewhat challenging the, the way that the audience uh, viewing habit as well, because uh, usually when you see a movie, uh, you, you look only one direction and you, you would see everything in front of you. And, the audience would be kind of feel more in charge or more in control of all the images. But now uh, all the images kind of, actually they happen around you. So uh, it's, it's kind of more like sound. Okay, next. Uh, this is my last one. Um, it's called End They Die a Natural Death. Uh, this one I just made uh, for, uh, a documenta in Kassel, um, Germany. And uh, this work uh, somewhat uh, follow my interest uh, in land, um, uh, uh, ecology, uh, writer's work. Um, but also, I feel like it's also um, kind of um, turning into a very different direction. Um, this one, it's, uh, it's a sound and shadow installation. And I also, in this work, I also work with uh, live uh, plants and live, uh, live performance of, uh, of the wind and um, flutes. 
um, so um, in this work, I collaborated, uh, work with uh, different people to make it happen because uh, there's a lot of technology involved. Um, the work was um, inspired by uh, autobiographical novel uh, by Bu Ngoc Tân. It's called A Tale a Told in the Year 2000, in which he um, he talked about his experience being a prisoner in the, the detention camp in the north in the late 60s and early 70s, um, uh, working uh, as forced labor in the forest. Uh, and in this, this novel, he actually, um, he, um, he described the many plants and trees and birds and animals in the forest. Um, and I had a chance to, uh, to talk to him uh, a few times uh, in the past before he died. And uh, I wanted to use a particular scene in the novel uh, when he talked about the, how the prisoners, uh, one day they came across a chili forest and they became crazy. And um, that scene ended with a death uh, of, uh, of an indigenous prisoner. Um, when the guards couldn't uh, couldn't stop them, um, yeah. So I installed the wind uh, sensors uh, in the forest at the side of the detention camp when the was there before, and so we use this uh, wind um, data live. Um, so it always live uh, live feed to the space in Castle, and uh, going to a controlling system. Um, to control, uh, we also designed a, a set of flutes um, based on the traditional musical instruments in Vietnam and the musical scale in Vietnam uh, and um, of the indigenous people in the North as well. Um, to, so this wind uh, direction and uh, intensity would uh, control how the flute would play and uh, also control the lighting system that make the shadow of the forest on the wall um, surrounding um, this platform. Um, yeah, so lastly, uh, you can play that clip and that will be the end of my presentation.
Many thanks, everybody. Uh, such a rich and um, fascinating um, set of presentations. I'm, I'm afraid we're kind of overrunning our allotted time. So I might suggest that we reconvene for a, 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 another panel in the not too far distant future to have more of a conversation about the presentations we've just heard. But perhaps before we move on to our poet, if I could just ask Pamela a very quick question um, about the, the, um, the issue that you teed up in your talk about socialist realism very kind of loosely configured. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, um, socialist realism was just as varied in China as you suggest, but I get have a sense that political circumstances might not have been quite so controlling in Vietnam. Uh, they certainly were in China, despite the diversity. I mean, perhaps you could comment on that. Yeah, um, kind of thinking about that in terms of how something like socialist realism is theorized, and it's important to have a kind of discursive formation that undergirds the practice. And my sense is that it may not have been as deeply theorized as part of a propaganda apparatus in Vietnam as it was in China, um, in terms of the number of people who are speaking to socialist realism as a, as a cultural project. Um, I think there's uh, probably less than a handful of writings in the context of Vietnam. I could be wrong about this, I really could be, but my sense is that it's less than a handful. Um, and really there's a one particular speech that a lot of art historians look to, which was um, uh, presented by the first secretary of the Communist Party, Chung Chin, about the relationship between Marxism and culture. Um, and he was considered sort of the heavy handed theorist of the party. Um, but beyond that, I, I don't I, I don't think that the yeah, I, I agree. I think it had to do probably with the political backdrop, the fact that you know there there was war. Um, there were other uses seen for artistic actors and writers, as Tanguyan said, um, that may have felt more urgent in terms of documentation and mobilization. Um, that required a different approach to art making as opposed to thinking about a kind of socialist realist art world and all the mechanisms that entailed, um, which is far more complicated and, and complex as an apparatus um, from what I understand in the, in the Chinese context. So, yeah, I think in the, yeah. Yeah, I think in the Chinese context, there's a heavy history as well of kind of political control and administration, which doesn't stop with communism. It continues into the Republican and then into the, the Maoist period, which I think contributes to that. And to, and to our artists, I, I mean, both of you have strong elements of realism, or at least engagements with realism in your work, um, uh, which you're mixing with, I think one of you referred to fantasy at one point, or certainly, forms of defamiliarization. I mean, what's your take on this? How do you relate to that past of modernism in, in Vietnam and a, a, a subsequent take on socialist realism? Does, do you have a self-conscious critical relationship to, to those artistic pasts? Tao, perhaps you could, could say something on that. Um. So uh, re regarding your questions um, of my uh, relationship to um, uh, modernism in, in Vietnam. So um, I think from uh, the presentation of, of Pamela, for example, um, I can see uh, clearly there is a, a division because of uh, official history of art in in Vietnam, which is more uh, north, like Hanoi oriented. And there's another, I consider more alternative way of thinking about art history in the south, which is less 
learned and less discussed because of our political situation. And I think my, from my own art education, it is uh, very based on uh, the colonial curriculum and also based on um, a realist or socialist view of, of our art education after reunification, which is still based on uh, field trips and a depicting of daily life. But for me, uh, um, what is intriguing is not to have illustrate those uh, historical moments or uh, those um, political contexts, which I personally felt um, scholars and uh, researchers from outside of Vietnam very focused on when talking about contemporary art in Vietnam. Uh, and I just personally feel it's a lot broader than the cap issues that relate to a very uh, specific idea about um, uh, the war in Vietnam or the political situation in Vietnam because we also uh, um, shaped by other interests such as uh, uh, abstraction was very strong in the South uh, and uh, poetry and literature and I feel there should be another way of reading uh, contemporary art in Vietnam that may be more based on formalism or kind of uh, move away from um, uh, uh, preconceived ideas about what uh, Vietnam could be or what kind of narrative it should be represented. So in my work, even though I still use this, this method of, of things that related to Vietnam, but in a sense, it is a kind of my own rejection of those uh, preconceived narrative in order to give, I don't know, just voices or another way of listening. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's a very, very informative answer. T, how about you? How do you respond to, to those issues? T, your microphone's off. <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't no, think I have a very direct connection to uh, modern, modernism in or socialism in Vietnamese mm. art. Uh, but I think in my practice, the like documentary and nonfiction is has all been always the base. And I also have the um, background being a journalist and um, um, and, and I think that uh, most of my work um, has been always uh, kind of driven by uh, curiosity. So my art, it's uh, always very much connected to real life. And uh, so I, I feel like, you know, making artwork is kind of like an excuse for me to explore different things, either history or memory or any kind of uh, nature or anything. Um, so it's, it's always very much connected to real life. Yeah. Oh, Paul, I think you're muted now. <laughs> we all do it, we all do it. Uh, thank you to both of you for those answers, which I think, you know, kind of complicate the, the kind of issues that I've just raised in a, a very interesting ways. Look, I think we will have to reconvene another, meet, uh, another panel at some point just to develop a broader conversation about this. But um, I think it's now time to move on to our uh, a poet of the evening. Uh, but thank you to everybody. That was absolutely excellent. Great stuff. Yeah, that was Caroline. incredible. Thank you so much. Um, a reminder, this is getting recorded and will be part of our archive. Um, and we have a wonderful tradition of ending our talks um, with a brief poetry reading. And we are really lucky to have Kai Gang Fan with us today, or tonight. <laughs> um, poet, translator, and essayist Kai Gang Fan is the author of the poetry collection Reenactments and the translator of Fan Yan Pao's selected volume of poems, Paper Bells. He is the recipient of fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, Bread Loaf. Um, and many other awards. Um, I won't take up too much time um, and I'm thrilled to pass it over to you. 
Dr. Zhang. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Carolyn, and thank you, uh, Pamela and Tao and T for your for your important work. Um, given this evening's topic, I, I thought I would read four poems um, that um, that engage with uh, art and artists, um, oftentimes around uh, the legacy of, of, of Vietnam, the Vietnam War, um, and immigration as well. Um, and the first is by uh, the first couple of poems are inspired by the photographer An Mi Le. And uh, what I find interesting about her work is that she uses 19th century techniques, like a 19th century field camera to create uh, these 20th, 20th century art representations. Um, and these are in the voice of imagined voices of you might think of as figures in the photos. The first one is called Small Wars. It was my turn to play dead, so I zipped up my flight suit and monkeyed into the cockpit. Larry, Tobias, and Tim formed the commando unit. Alfredo got the shaft again and played Charlie all by himself. Wasting no time, they slipped back into the woods like ghost soldiers and waited for the signal. Sunlight bombed the forest floor. I pulled the pin on the smoke grenade, tossed it under a tremendous wing, then slumped over my aircraft like a limp rag doll. In minutes, the shooting began. All hell broke loose as planned. Someone sprayed blanks into the enemy trees, laying cover for the others. I could hear the branches and twigs snapping under the boots of my rescuers. Someone radioed for helicopters and phantom jets that would never materialize. Pine cones dropped from great invisible heights. Black smoke seeped into my eyes and blood rushed to my head and dangling arms. A giant cicada singed the air with its emergency song, too late, too late. When I came to, the stars in my jungle burned like sodium flares. And the next poem, the next image. A brief history of reenactment. On day one, the photographer walks into camp and immediately starts shooting. She shoots us at breakfast, eating our sea rations, in our hammocks, reading stars and stripes. She shoots us in her sleep. When we first cross paths at the creek, she says, hello, tiger, nice combat boots. Is that thing real? Pointing to my special forces jungle shirt. I'm afraid so, I say nonchalantly, trying to mask my satisfaction. Day two. No more messing around. The photographer has agreed to join the action. So what's the scenario? A lone gorilla left over in a booby-trapped village jumps out of a hidey hole and ambushes the platoon on a search and destroy. Good thing I brought my black pajamas and sandals. What a trooper. She also plays the captured prisoner, the native informant, and the beautiful turncoat. The sniper girl is her favorite role because it's like taking pictures. The beauty, the beauty, her voice volleys spookily from behind some rocks as she picks off one of my men after another. Sometimes the photographer shoots herself. I know she has her own personal baggage. Later I find her sobbing in the bamboo grove. I tell her, it's okay. These wars only last three days. What will you do when it's all over, she asks. I don't know, I say. Plan the next one? On day three, after another routine patrol, we sit together on my favorite log in the shade of oaks and devise more scenarios. The topo map unfolds across our laps like a magic carpet. She's got killer bangs above camera eyes. I mark all the dangers and landing zones. She speaks of controlled light and the hole that opens up when you press the shutter button. At 2400, our hands nearly touch. 
there was a meteor shower, a call in mortar fire. And next poem is inspired um, by an installation I saw, well, first in Chicago um, and then in Des Moines, Iowa. So it's funny to think about both the diaspora and sort of circulation of, of art and art objects. Um, ballistics. In a ballistics lab in Maryland, three artists known as the Propeller Group aimed assault rifles at each other and fired them simultaneously into gel blocks constructed to resemble human flesh. Fragments of the projectiles fused on impact float suspended around a flower of smoke. Shot through with light, the resulting 21 gel blocks, like this one, elegantly displayed inside a custom vitrine enchant. On a flat screen hanging on the wall like a black canvas, the collision replays on a single channel loop in extreme slow motion, the bullets tearing the surface of the scene as when a lake breaks from a stone. The AK-47 versus the M16 was on view at the Des Moines Art Center that Thursday evening back in early June when I visited one last time with you. Little cloud bursts we left on the glass, pierced flower, bright insects, tiny supernova. I stopped looking. You were there. We turned and walked away. And I'll read one more poem. Um, inspired by paintings by Julie Murutu that I saw in Iowa of all places before I knew um, Murutu's work. And uh, it's sort of in the voice of uh, the artists and there's some found language from interviews and, and uh, whatnot. On some paintings by Julie Murutu, it's like the sky, it's like the sky torn to pieces of blue, green, red, yellow, pink, raining light, raining lines. Walk around in them, you get soaked with sensory data as an ambler in the city, it's deluge of signs and sounds. It's not exactly a landscape. I don't paint places. I'm a painter of displacement, of placelessness. For me, abstraction, is the name of this in-between place where I like to go and spend a lot of time looking, just looking, looking and sorting out, feeling my way through and into a painting, its layers, shapes, directions. That's why cities and architecture, weather and tattoos. That's why accumulation and erasure and excavation, why mark, trace, scrape, sand, rub, and color. It can take years to resolve into what you see here, sometimes a month, quite possibly never, maybe sooner than you think. The, the erasure is the action. What do you see? I see the ghosts of buildings from Baghdad, New York, Saigon. It's not important for you to know the references, nor the statues of peaceful gods dwelling inside caves, now blasted, stolen, and removed, but not from memory. It's a hard thing to erase a trail. You can recover a lot of information if you just stay at it. The quest, the question is, how do you paint the image of absence? It's like an angel this painting, an angel I once saw in a black and white movie, an angel in a trench coat perched atop a skyscraper, eavesdropping on the sea of human voices below. The angel seemed terribly moved, but I don't recall seeing tears or what the people said to each other 
were alone to themselves, in what tongues, in which country they spoke to move the angel, my angel, so much he decided to fall, to become human, to stand before, above, inside, and beside a vast and changing work called Untitled, Rogue Ascension, Entropia Circulation, Diffraction Local Calm Refuge, and the millionth sequel of People on Sunday. This painting is not a description. I want you to feel it. Please have a visceral reaction. Orient yourself in the shape of arrows, in the image of leaps. Come closer. Now step back. I can't, won't spell it out. Become nobody, nowhere, and nothing. This painting is like a species of refuge we think of when it rains. Into these ruins we run. You are always invited. I don't know where I'm going when I'm setting out. It's like a walk in the park, this painting. Thank you. Oh, thank you so, so much, Hidang. That was truly a beautiful way to close us out today. Um, thank you all for joining here. Um, we, uh, again, the recording of this will be up in our archives. So um, we'll be sending that around and be sure to check our events page. Um, I just want to extend our gratitude really again to you all, Pamela, um, Pantau, uh, Jinti, and Paul. Um, and uh, we will see you back here tomorrow, different time, our normal time, 1 p.m. Eastern, um, for our event on the nature of things at Andrew Krepp's um, gallery. And um, you can turn your microphones on and say goodbye as you all leave. Thank you so much again. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Goodbye. See you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you all so much. Thank you really so much. appreciate it. Thank you. True art. Thank you so much, Hi, for the beautiful reading. Thank you, Tao. Good to see you. Come on, rất nhiều. Come on, rất nhiều. Super. Come on, mọi người. Good to see you guys. Hopefully we see each other again super soon, okay? Thanks for this thoughtful conversation. Yeah, it's time for us to be somewhat united in spite of everything else going on in the world. We always get united through arts, to humanity, to poetry, to everything else in between. That's the, the best honors voice we can express ourselves so that's super important you guys keep it alive would you please do <laughs> yeah thank you <laughs> thank you thank you so much thank you so much take care thank you you guys bye